What you know about layer one D5, greatest in the world, and they finally about to see why. What you know about XRD, I'm smart money, I ain't never on a decline. What you know about NFTs, it's not just Ace, when well, you finally gonna realize. You need scalability, need more utility, then you better call on these guys. I'm going radical, I'm going radish, I'm going radical, I'm going radish. I just be D5, never on a decline, building the future, I feel like a savage. Hello and welcome. I am Piers Ridiard, CEO of RDX Works, a core developer of the decentralized finance protocol Radix, a public ledger entirely focused on bringing DeFi into the mainstream. This is our podcast, The DeFi Download, a show about decentralized finance and all things crypto, where we dive into the details of the projects, assets, and services that are driving the DeFi revolution. Today, I'm joined by Jake Berkman, founder, CEO, managing partner of CoinFund. CoinFund is a crypto native investment firm and registered investment advisor. The team specializes in portfolio management, token design, decentralized networks, research, trading, market structure, engineering, brand strategy, law, and regulation. Investments have included Dapper Labs, Upshot, The Graph, Balancer, and Fuel Labs. Jake, thank you so much for coming on the show. Hey, Pierce. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. So, um, I think that it would be interesting, I, I think it's always interesting to hear like how investors got, got into the space, like got into the job of investing, as well as like how you came to found coin funds. So I'd love to like just hear a, a bit about that. Of course. Um, so my, my background is in mathematics and computer science. And, you know, I'm, I'm generally like a pretty dual brained guy, like m mostly doing tech for work and, and doing a little bit of like art and stuff on the side, uh, which by the way, is one of the reasons why I'm early to NFTs, because I'm actually a digital art uh, creator myself. Nice. Um, I, uh, my career for about 10 years or so was mostly in FinTech. And I had a stint in pure tech at Amazon, where I was a technical product manager and engineer. And my parents nice. um, were technologists on Wall Street. So this idea of like, Marrying technology and finance was always, you know, from inception, you might say, like on my radar. Um, yeah. And so when I when I saw kind of Bitcoin back in 2011, and then subsequently Ethereum in 2015, um, you know, I this really like this intersection of of finance and tech um, really sort of spoke to me. And um, it was, you know, I was following Bitcoin for for a number of years. Um, but it really wasn't until Vitalik's white paper uh, for Ethereum that that there was like a light bulb that, wait a minute, this is a new digital asset class. And so um, as a tech person, my first inclination was like, if I want to work in this space full time, maybe I should start a tech startup. But it was also very obvious that we were so early in the innovation curve of blockchain technology and there would be so much innovation and so many technologies would be obsolete before we got to, got to the right answer. By the way, we're not done with that process quite yet. No, um, not even close. That it became obvious to me that I should become an investor. It was always an interest of mine. I was always like looking for alternative asset classes to invest. That I was doing like um, like peer to peer lending back in like 2006 uh, as a form of investment. Um, but I also wanted. I didn't want to forget the tech side. Like I wanted to help build these things. I wanted to be alongside the founders as they were doing it. Um, and so CoinFund was a way for us to, um, you know, help blockchain technology develop, get adopted in practical, right. responsible ways, but also be an investor who was hands-on helping to build the things and, and helping the founders achieve like a longer term success in what they were doing. So that's, uh, we're now, Seven and a half years full time investors in, in blockchain. So our seven year so, anniversary was so in July. I, congratulations. I like the story. It glosses over some like clearly tricky bits, right? Because <laughs> Like the first thing being like, I decided I'm going to be an investor. Like being an investor is hard, right? You got to raise yeah. funds. You got to get your. You got to get your first. I mean, it's like it's a lot like starting a starting a startup in some ways. Is you've got to convince other people to give you money to build something that will deliver them more value than the. Yeah. So, well, well, so 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 you, so you bring up an excellent point. I'm happy to like double click on that for a second. So my last job in Trad World was this was a CTO a CTO of basically. Um, you know, an alternative data company. And what that company focused on was studying 
private technology companies prior to them going public um, and really doing it in a very like data driven quantitative way right so we we do things like um, you know we'd look up like all the publicly available data about for example uber right like we'd you know we'd look at all the historic rates what cities were they in at what time uh, how many taxis did they have registered in new york because new york keeps track of that right and we would like really like go down and really understand deeply technology companies and this was really like the precursor of me getting into you know sort of early stage tech investing but you're totally right like as an engineer i'm sort of a quote unquote like fake investor in the sense that <laughs> i became an investor like through crypto um right. and learned everything that i know about it you know by actually doing it and so how did you get like what was the what was the first money into coin fund was that your own capital and like of friends and family, or did you go out and actually get sort of some initial like bigger LPs from people that you were pitching even at the start? No, I mean, it was impossible at that, you know, in 2015, first of all, there's no right. institutions writing checks whatsoever right. into, into this <laughs> space. Um, you know, high net worth individuals were incredibly skeptical and thought this right. was like probably a scam. And so our first right. fund was, was very much friends and family money. Like, my dad was the first investor in, you know, besides myself, a bunch of our friends from, from Brooklyn and some, some of the early folks who later became, um, you know, important, um, let's say, co-founders at CoinFund were investors in that first fund. But it was, um, you know, it was a small thing. It was an experiment. Um, and, you know, it actually remains the uh, best performing uh, coin fund, quote unquote, today. So what was the, what was the, what was the total size of the of fund one? And then what was the, uh, what was the ROI? Um, it was less than a million bucks. Let me put it that way. Less and than a million did, bucks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It did like so far, it's actually still being liquid, but it's done like 40 X cash on cash. Um, and still has a bunch more juice. That's amazing. So like, um, I think also really inspirational, right? Like anyone who's thinking, I can never, I could never like build an investment fund. I'm super interested in investing. Um, it like being early and having high conviction is clearly, uh, and, and getting, getting some other people to believe in you, I think is a key part of this as well, right? Getting other people to put money in, even if it's friends and family, even if it's just like a small number of people that also changes your perspective, I imagine on how you're investing, how you're thinking about allocating capital. I mean, I would say that in those early days, we're very much in, in learning mode. And the idea was that there was a bunch of opportunities in the market. A lot of the opportunities were like highly questionable. Some of the opportunities <laughs> were, would, would go on to become, uh, you know, incredibly large things, large networks, you know, have in, insane returns, right? And the idea in those days was to try to get to the truth of it, right? To apply the scientific right. method to give every project a chance to evaluate it on its technology and its merits on its team, you know? Um, and, and again, like that meant that that fund was very early in Ethereum, in Bitcoin, um, in some of the kind of early um, attempts to create, you know, what we have called dApps. So for example, you know, one of our first investments was Augur, which is, it was a decentralized, platform for for prediction i mean i know i know you guys have been around like through that period because right you know i've known your name uh i've known radix for like many many years and we actually spoke on the phone like back in must have been early 16 or something like that but um wow yeah yeah and um and so you know it, it was a learning it was a learning mode and a lot of things about the market changed a lot of the quality of founders i think has improved. A lot of the processes have become standardized. Um, you know, it, and back then we were kind of, you know, pretty much the only crypto fund. And today there's hundreds of them. So like looking back at that, that time, that history, um, obviously for, for a traditional investor, there's the, the, the three things that generally talked about, which is like uh, team technology and traction for early stage, sort of early stage to mid-stage investments what are, what are the patterns that you see in crypto that sort of you just don't see elsewhere and that you guys look for in addition to those things 
Yeah, I mean, this is an excellent, excellent question. So, um, like, at some point, I published a blog post, which literally is what we look for, the nine core value propositions of crypto networks. And sort of the idea is to just speak a little bit to our core thesis, right? And the core thesis is that um, to answer the question of what can blockchain technology do beyond just cryptocurrency, beyond just Bitcoin? I mean, I think that I think the, the general answer at this point, you know, seven and a half years later, um, is that they is that blockchain technology can create open, public, permissionless, decentralized, uh, user owned, uh, and user governed networks, and essentially those are public goods. It, in, at, at its very base, what this shift is is creating a new way that products and services can come to market not necessarily just through a corporation which is hierarchical and has a CEO, but also thinking about, you know, can we do this in a more distributed way? And by the way, the results of that experiment are, are definitely like mixed. Um, it's not clear that, you know, hierarchical organizations aren't the best at, at producing products, but what blockchains do better than corporations is things like transparency, security, ownership, capital formation, and like all these like really competitive um, angles that can be used to compete with traditional companies. And so to answer your question, what we look for, like what fits into the crypto mandate for a coin fund investment is a gamut of things. Like on one side of those, of that gamut is a very decentralized network. And on the other side is a very centralized technology company with equity but what they all have in common is that they use some of these value propositions of blockchain technologies in a way that they can compete with whoever came before. And that's the thing that we're investing in, in this shift to like a different operating system of, of, of doing things. That's really interesting. You, you guys are also sort of looking at um, the overlap, or you personally are looking at the overlap between crypto and AI. Um, yes. And for me, I've always been quite skeptical about that, just from the point of view of it feels it, like there was a lot of projects. I mean, just going back to 2015, 2016, there was a lot of projects that sort of tried to mash those two almost buzzwords together. And a lot of the time, it didn't, like when you looked at it, it was only skin deep. So what, what are you seeing as the insight or is the thing that is going to make the overlap between crypto and AI work from a like deep value delivery point of view? Openness is the short answer, right? So if you look at how, like AI is not a new field. I mean, it's obviously been around for decades. It's not a new field, even in terms of kind of the most up-to-date models that we deal with, you know, deep learning and, and some of the models that we're seeing play out right now. Th these are all things that have been sort of uh, kind of come to market for, for 10 years. There's multi-billion dollar enterprise AI companies right now, right? This is not a new field. But what is new is this idea that, you know, every big model that came, well, I should, I should take a step back. So one, one innovation that's happened like fairly recently is that people started creating these like larger, more general models that have turned out to be better at specific tasks than specific models made for those tasks. And we call those foundation models. And um, an example would be like Dolly 2. Dolly 2 just went and sort of like learned all of these images and now it can translate text into images. And this is what's called generative AI. This is the hot thing right now. Everyone's creating AI outputs. Uh, everyone knows that it, it's not just limited to images. It could be videos, it could be 3D models, it could be audio. Could be podcasts one day. You watch out, Pierce. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but the point is um, that these models, because they're so big, they require you know like large amounts of computation. Sometimes to the tune of you know a million dollars or ten million dollars or fifteen million dollars. They are, for the moment, they're kind of like in the realm of proprietary big tech companies. These are the people who have the AI talent who create the models. They have the best clean data sets. They have $50 million to blow on a, on a neural network computation and training, right? Um, but what's happened like literally in the last 
couple of weeks, like maybe last two months or so, is that a company called Stability AI has, has created, you know, what it is essentially an, a Dolly competitor, but that is more efficient and it's open. Its source code is open. Its model weights are open. People can refine the models. People have optimized the models. So now you can run it literally on your desktop, on your Mac M1 laptop, right? And what we're seeing is that the effect of this openness is that the innovation in AI is going like this. I'm making a, a hand gesture, which is means inflection point, growing very fast, right? Um, and so like that is awesome, but it's also like very difficult to monetize in traditional ways, right? So if these models are open and, and like anyone can compute them and anyone can crowdfund money to compute such a model, you know, it's not as interesting uh, anymore. Uh, it doesn't capture it, it, as much value, in other words. And like a lot of the products around these models, a lot of the ways that you can use stable diffusion today, um, you know, are these like open source ways, like you download you know, an app on your desktop or you download some, some GitHub package and kind of install it on your computer and then you, and then you deal with it. And, and so why I think Web3 is interesting here is because Web3 is precisely the technology that can allow you to work with open technologies but, continue, but have them continue to be valuable, right? And I have a whole like podcast on this I did, I did elsewhere, like looking at, you know, blockchains as, public, as common goods technology, right? Right. And so like take a look at Eleuther AI or, or Leon, right? These are open data sets that are critical to creating these large models. And these open data sets are even used by closed proprietary models that live inside of big companies. But these open organizations that create these data sets, they're composed of highly qualified individuals that are sort of like, you know, working in a nonprofit capacity, or, you know, they're just kind of like privately funded, you know, for the common good to do these things. But we could do so much better potentially with Web3 primitives. We could do things like tokenization, we could crowdfund the computation of these models and then give discounts and early access to the crowdfunder. So like kind of a Kickstarter model, we can use DAOs to create sort of more distributed ownership of open data sets. We can use other forms of tokenization, like for example, governance tokens to kind of govern what goes into a data set. Like recently, um, I know I'm going on about this, but, but recently like a lot of artists have come forward and they said, hey, we didn't necessarily consent to having our art be used by these models. But now what people can do is they can put our name into Dolly 2 and generate something that looks like our artwork, but we never gave permission for this, right? So right. there's a whole like AI safety issue, AI governance issue that could potentially be solved, you know, in a web three way. And that's that's what I'm like really interested in. And then I'll, I'll say like one last thing, you know, and then I'll, and then please ask me questions. Um, but, but, but the last no, thing is I mean, just, it's, it's, it's just computation, right? One of one of the one of the most um, sort of obvious use cases of Web three is creating large scale, highly efficient, cheap, um, and effective computation networks. And we actually made our first investment in this area last year with a company called Jensen AI. This is a decentralized network right. for training neural models, neural network models. Excuse me. Okay, so like. I think I get a lot of this, right? Um, the bit that I sort of struggle with is the, once the model is trained, like the, the, the expensive bit is training the model. Once the model is trained, the sort of like the querying of the model and the ongoing sort of like iterative learning is, is, is a lot cheaper. And it sort of feels a little bit like the pharmaceutical industry, where you, as, as a pharmaceutical company, what I do is I spend all of my time looking for a molecule that allows me to solve a particular illness. That's the expensive bit, the research and development. Once I've found the molecule, um, you then, they then 
patent, rush to patent them, to create a monopoly that enables them to re retrieve back the money that they spent in developing in the first place. And it's that that little bit there that I, I I'm sort of I struggle to sort of connect how you go from like an open learn, open development, but then still let the people who invested in that happening in the first place make sure that they monetize the output of the of the final model so that there is a return on investment. Even if like someone has to pay for the computation, that might be the people who are paying speculatively on the expected outcome of that. But then how do they make sure they recoup that investment from what is created in the model if the model is open and the outcome is open? Yeah, I mean, th th this is an excellent question. And I don't, I mean, there's a lot of controversy right now, like as we speak, sort of VC Twitter is tweeting a lot about um, how, you know, people are making a mistake investing in generative AI, because, you know, there's really like no clear monetization for this type of thing. And, you know, and so so you bring up good points. But I think, um, well, there's a few things to say. I mean, one, one, obvious way to monetize this stuff is just productization. So like, right, like right now, if you actually want to use these models, it's very, very rudimentary. It's sort of you go in, you put in a prompt, you get an output. But the reality is that these models are capable of so much more like you can take. Um, by the way, there's a product, I think it's strmr.com. There's a product where you can like upload like 20 photos of yourself and fine tune the um, the stable diffusion model, it's called, uh, it's a Google uh, paper that's called Dream Booth. And basically then you have this concept of Jake or Pierce that you could use in a prompt and you can say like Pierce on a bicycle wearing a leather jacket, you know, go into the store or whatever it is. And it will like generate like a likeness of you. Um, there's all these operations that you could um, affect with these models. You can upscale images. You could take one image and and uh, and what's called in paint it, which means you replace a subset of it. You can out paint it. You can expand the boundaries of a photograph like infinitely outward, right? And the kind of the point I'm trying to make is that there's so much functionality here, but there's no like good interface to actually like the the best interfaces that give you this functionality. They kind of look like like airplane cockpits, and they kind of need like an engineer at the wheel, you know. And, right. you know, the analogy that I think of is Photoshop, right? Photoshop, right. Right. it's a little piece of software that anyone can write in theory. And they've certainly gone to great lengths to make sure that people don't pirate it. But, um, but at the end of the day, like they are the premier uh, kind of interface to, you know, right. photo editing. Or if you think about like Figma as a premier interface to collaborative uh, creation of like web graphics or whatever, right? And so th there's definitely like some indication that these tools can be powerful. And what's different here is that the power of the AI kind of goes like 10x beyond what we were able to do before. And and so right. the person who creates the Photoshop of AI, you know, is is potentially going to make a bunch of money. Yeah, I mean, like the, the 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 like back of the head opening moment that someone said to me for AI one day was like, in the future, the like the desktop of the future will be nothing but a text command prompt, and everything will be built from scratch that you need. Like you go, oh, I you know, I want to I want to write a letter, and you will get like the perfect little write letter writing piece of software that is just there for you to use that, and then it, and then you go like whatever, like you don't actually have the concept of programs that are mass distributed anymore. You just like you just the thing I need, I describe the thing I need and then I use the thing I need and whatever the best tool for the job is. And I think that like ability to, the, the through natural language, the ability to create a, a closer um, communication between what it is that someone desires and what the computer is able to facilitate in matching that desire is incredible. And for me, the thing about that I'm really interested in, and like I'm starting to see potential paths forwards here is like how the generative AI and creative AI and these algorithms result in assets that actually have value at the end of it. And like NFTs are a great component of that. And I, and I know that you look a lot at like NFT financialization. So like, what does, what does that mean to you? How do you think of NFTs as an asset class and how do you think those are going to expand and continue to be more financialized? Great question. So, um, I mean, historically, right, digital assets, really like all assets, but let's focus on the digital assets, 
Um, they're kind of divided into these two subcategories, fungible assets and non-fungible assets. Fungible assets are things like tokens, currencies, equities, you know, things that um, have units that are sort of interoperable with each other, substitutable mm -hmm. for each other. And mm -hmm. non-fungible assets are the things that are like singularly unique and are not substitutable right. for, for other such assets. So that's kind of like your house. You don't necessarily want to switch your house with your neighbor's house because they're not the same house. They're different. One could be right. bigger and so forth. And if you kind of like look at the, if you look at the um, uh, kind of the set of assets in the world, what you, what you start to realize is that like actually most assets are non-fungible. Like there's only like 5,000 different kinds of stocks in the stock market and there's only a handful right. of currencies. Um, right. But the number of like goods and, jewelry and housing and cars and other like assets that very much out, out, outnumber fungibles. And so right. historically in digital assets, fungibles were the things that were liquid and non-fungibles were things that are illiquid. And fungibles are liquid yep. because they have this familiar mechanism of, you know, the exchange microstructure order books, right. That enable right. them, you know, together with Coinbase and Binance and, and, and the rep and, and, um, uh, kind of decentralized exchanges as well, you can fairly easily create mechanisms for uh, fungible liquidity. And a lot of people in the space have looked at non-fungibles and they said, look, this is always going to be kind of a, a less liquid asset class because in order to create liquidity for non-fungible, what you got to do is you got to like put up a, you know, a for sale sign and you have to find a counterparty that's willing to transact with you, give you money and you give them, you know, the asset and that's how you create liquidity. Now, yeah, I mean, that, I, that's, yeah. I mean, yeah. like, like, let, let, like, let's look at the history of finance a little bit and like, just like, I mean, clearly not right. Right. Like the, that position, because you, there, there's, there's a few interesting things that we see in finance, right. From the point of view of like, um, coffee or rice, we'd taken things that actually were kind of non-fungible and we created like fungible categories within them to make them tradable as like the middle ground where you can go, this class of thing is approximately this grade, so we'll just trade those as that grade. Diamonds yeah. is another example of that. But then non-fungible, turning non-fungibles into fungible financial assets, like look at securitization, look at like packaging up credit card loans, packaging up mortgages, all this kind of stuff. That that happens a lot. Um, uh, sorry, like I just, uh, when people talk about this idea that non-fungible assets are going to be less liquid, I get very exercised because I'm like, no, it's definitely not right. Right. Well, well. I, so I'm with you. And like the reason that I arrived at that conclusion, like within digital assets is because we saw how, um, you know, sort of crypto economic mechanisms could create a bunch of liquidity. And so we saw that in fungibles, like a couple of years ago, if you had a token and you actually, you actually might, might know this since you had a token a couple of years ago, it was very difficult to get that token listed on an exchange. It might take a year. Right. It might take an opinion from lawyers. It might take paying Binance, you know, some large sum of money. And then what happened in 2020 was that DEXs really sort of came to market and they, came to market because of this thing called the liquidity mining program. And what that means is that people would allocate tokens and token supplies that um, compensated uh, liquidity providers. And suddenly we went from a world where it took a year for a token to become liquid to a world where a token could become liquid with a couple of million bucks of daily volume, like literally overnight. Right. right? And it's just, it's right. just a different level of efficiency. Now, having seen that, then you look over at NFTs and you say, wait a minute, if we can do that, then what's the mechanism that makes NFTs really liquid? And sort of the conclusion that I came to, and I wrote a blog post about this and must have been uh, January of 2021, it's called um, Appraisal Games and the NFT Liquidity Problem. The conclusion that I came to is that you just need one basic primitive, and that is the ability to appraise, you know, this like kind of non-fungible good. And that seems like a hard problem. Like, how do you do that? Well, it turns out that machine learning is like really amazing at that. It's almost like <laughs> built for, for it. Machine learning models, they'll take a bunch of factors about NFTs. How big is the series? Who's the creator? What kind of sales did they have in the series? What kind of sales the creator had before? How many, you know, YouTube 
followers and Twitter followers and social media followers that they have, you know, have like, did they, did they sell something for a large amount of money before? Like, are people, like, there's all these like quantitative factors that machine learning models are amazing at crunching and turning into an output, which is kind of a plausible price for an NFT. And this is exactly what is the subject of our portfolio company, Upshot.xyz. Upshot is a, you know, essentially a pricing mechanism using machine learning. Um, they price uh, almost 12,000 NFT series today. They price it with like one giant machine learning model. And once you have that pricing primitive, well, it's still not quite real, but what happens is it gives market makers this anchor point. They're like, here's a plausible price, not just the floor price of a series, but for every individual item in the series. And what we see with floor prices is because these have been the only kind of pricings so far is that there's a lot of market makers that transact at the floor price. But when these hmm. data feeds of reference pricing in general come out, then market makers will be able to create kind of more general strategies for market making every single NFT that's out there. And thus they will turn the NFT space liquid. That's what's happening like right now as we speak. So, so you don't you don't think that there's going to be sort of the next level of abstraction there? You don't think that we're going to go to securitization and, and baskets of assets? Because from the point of view of, I suppose, um, you, like in, in market, in traditional markets, you have the concept of like uh, market risk and idiosyncratic risk, like the risk of an individual asset versus the risk of the, 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 the overall market. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're dealing with like individual fungi uh, non-fungible items, you are dealing with like more idiosyncratic risk in many ways, unless yeah. you're able to diversify that. Because, you know, it could be that, let's take Bored Apes, for example, right? Yeah. Bored Apes, the, the, there, is, there, there is currently a bunch of things are out about Bored Apes that indicate that there may be a load of like racist tropes being used in Bored Apes. Now that may make some of the Bored Apes that have those racist tropes in them like much less valuable, but the market decides that they're just going to cut that bit out and ignore it and then just concentrate on the ones that don't have those bits in it or whatever. Like there, mm. there, there's an idiosyncratic risk of individual assets that may fall outside of. So, so then what from a market maker's point of view, that's fine because I'm not taking one bet. I'm taking many bets because I'm just buying and selling like a, a basket of these assets. But for the individual retail investor or the individual person who's trying to get exposure, do we not think that maybe we're going to go to more of these basketed approaches via like the correct um, form of, uh, or, of, um, as you say, like being able to rate these properly is really important. That's what made securitization possible. That's where standards and pools make their money, right? But like using AI to do that in the more complicated, more open, transparent way is an, is an amazing idea. But is that going to lead to this basket approach where that, those will be liquid more than the underlying? Yeah, I don't, I don't want you to think that I am excluding like the idea of... Um, putting these assets in baskets or creating, you know, what I would call like indices of NFTs, right? But I'm just kind of making the point that the pricing, the ability to price these things, it, like without necessarily having actual sales in the market, that's the primitive that enables all of those things, right? So like, like my kind of, there's a little bit of secret sauce here, but like my, my kind of way of, of thinking about it is, you know, I can think of a smart contract that using an or a, a priced feed uh, can actually like make all NFTs liquid. And so whenever I whenever I like find a startup that's working on a NFT like liquidity problem type of a problem, then I sort of compare them to that contract and say, how efficient are you like relative to that? And that contract is very simply a vault or a basket, if you will. That in order to, for an asset to go into that vault, it has to be priced by the oracle, and then a commensurate number of tokens has to be issued in accordance with its price. And then if you want to like withdraw, you know, an asset from from the basket, then you got to reprice it again at the time, 
You got to burn those tokens and then you got to withdraw it, right? And so when you when you create that smart contract, what you're creating is a cryptocurrency that is backed by the appraised prices of these assets. It's as, it becomes asset backed. And so I think like if you create such a contract and this contract is adopted at scale by all the market participants and all the market makers and, and everything, then you just simply solve all NFT liquidity, like period. <laughs> but the Apart hard part, ones that the hard part no, is adoption. No history, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, there, there's the, it's sort of like, it's the, it's the middle bit as well, right? Because a new in, you still need the venture capital. You still need the, the people who take that, that really early risk on a collection before it's even been issued on a new artist before it's even been issued on being the one that yes. like goes, yeah, cool. I bought, I bought the original set and like became part of the community first. And like the community being like sort of key to this like idea before that the asset even exists. Um, but yes, I absolutely. Once the asset has sort of like taken its first tentative steps into existence and trading, the, the this this just makes it so much more liquid, um, and, but that's the same problem that we have with tokens, right? It's like mm -hmm. getting the initial token buyer market is should be the hardest bit. Once it's once you've done that, then sort of having it listed on decentralized exchanges and generating liquidity around it has now massively been commoditized. And I think that's if that's going to happen with NFTs, that's that's going to completely blow the uh, blow. I think it'll blow fungible stuff out of the water, as you say. But like, do you think when you talk about NFT financialization, we've started with art? Yeah. Like, what what is what is the list of the next three things in the order that you see them coming? Yeah. So 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 like when you look at the market today, um, and this has been the case now, I guess for a little bit over a year, maybe almost two years, right? Like the the predominant uh, and preeminent use cases of NFTs is digital art, which is how kind of the original NFT boom sort of started. But then like more presciently, like most of the volume is now in collectibles, like you mentioned apes and, and maybe punks as well and and so forth. Right. And then there's a there's another vertical, which is like in-game assets that a lot of people are positing will be the next leg of NFT adoption that I'm a little bit more skeptical about, but right. uh, but it is a significant portion of volume of the GMV today. So those three things sort of explain the current NFT GMV, and at the height of that market, call that, uh, I don't know, uh, like December of 21, that was run rating more than all global art sales GMV like in pre <laughs> previous years. So just on those three categories, and just with a couple of tens of thousands of enthusiasts, we sort of managed to out GMV the art world. Now, what's next? Well, what's next could be like really like boring things like that you would expect. So tokenizing music, tokenizing movies, tokenizing real estate, tokenizing the, uh, the deed to your car or something like the title to your right. car. Sorry. Um, right. And then, and then there could be like, like really new things that we've never done before. So that would be like tokenizing blog posts that, um, Right. Mirror.xyz mirror maybe is like a good example of that. And I know that people already trade. Like when you when you create a post on Mirror today, you have the option of like adding a bunch of NFTs that people could just claim or, or buy to compensate you for, for the writing. But then those NFTs kind of, they trade on their own like secondary markets and acquire like a life of their own. So, I mean, that's a fascinating approach, right? Here's a market where, uh, first of all, we've never turn blogs into assets before but yet think about how many like billions of blogs there are and the blogs that we have monetized in the past like how many what percentage of blogs are monetized maybe like single digit percentages because there's right. one and only one working monetization right. model for that which is advertising and you essentially right. have to be like a top blogger it's very hard to do that now where you have to work for like a publisher who has that type of revenue and we're going from that world to a world where, you know, a writer can actually make money from their work by, by using this alternative monetization scheme using tokens or NFTs or something like that. And to me, that is super exciting because it opens up this new 
kind of market that has never been traded on a secondary before. And you can think of it as like this giant global public IPO of blog posts and it's just like, whoa. And then, you know, and then, and then like, if you ask me and if you read our thesis on our blog at coinfund.io, there's a post I made in 2020, which is called all digital content is going on chain. The lowest mm. hanging fruit for NFTs is, as it says, all digital content. So, you know, talk, think about icons, think about fonts, uh, think about clip art, think about uh, stock photos, although AI is, put, is poised to put a dent in that now. Um, right. Right. But like, but like all of these markets that traditionally investors don't really think of as sexy could become right. quite a bit bigger if you remove the middleman from, let's say, the stock photo markets and right. replace it with like a decentralized marketplace where photographers can sell stock photos directly to licensees because the technology is so efficient and you could do that now, you know, that could potentially be 10 times bigger than it is today, right? Um, yeah, I, so I think I, I think, think a lot of people talked about I think a lot of people talked about this idea of continually talk about this idea of like real world assets uh, going on ledger like real estate or like um, car deeds and stuff like that. I do think that's going to take longer. Like it's been oh right, real estate tokenized real estate man. Like I I remember that from twenty fifteen. Well, <laughs> absolutely, but there's been like an interesting shift, right? So from like twenty fifteen to maybe like a couple of years ago. The view was, well, what's blocking this tokenization is the regulatory frameworks, and we really need like security tokens to come around, and then we can we're, we're going to begin to like tokenize real estate. And the trend now is actually like, screw waiting for security tokens. We can just tokenize uh, in a different way through like LLCs and, and NFTs. And NFTs right. are actually the predominant way of, of tokenizing real estate right now. Right, which make which makes complete sense. Um, I I think that, that I think you're right though that like we haven't really bottomed out the full range of digital first assets that are actually quite easy to continue to tokenize like like stock photography, like domain names, like you know sort of all of these assets that we think of as as digital first. I mean, as you say, music royalties, all this kind of stuff. Um, so the last topic I wanted to talk about was um, uh, scalability of blockchains. So yes. um, obviously you, you've been around for for a decent period of um, in the crypto market, and you've got you you have seen a number of like scalability solutions coming to market, and you could we continue to see the sort of congestion on networks and problems with that. How do you guys think about sort of the next phase of scalability for public ledgers? It's a really good question, and I think like in some ways we're in this. Um, quantum superposition where it could go a bunch of different ways and no one has quite collapsed the wave function yet but but basically you know <laughs> um you know I mean, people have opinions on that I'll, I'll i'll tell you kind of like what the field is so so only like a few years ago it must have been 2017 or 2018 or something like neural rubini went up in front of the u.s congress and was like guys like blockchains don't scale period right so I'm really happy to report that that is not the case anymore. We have thoroughly solved the blockchain scalability technology problems with many, many different technologies. Some technologies that I can name are proof of stake. So we just went through the Ethereum merge, right? Where we're moving Ethereum to POS. We've seen layer two, which means kind of secondary networks that settle to Ethereum or another base layer. And those generally come in two flavors, optimistic rollups, which are already in the market, and zero knowledge rollups that are like rapidly coming to market for many, many different companies. Um, we've seen alternative blockchains. Like I always kind of thought of, of your guys' thing as you know, a different form of, of consensus and just kind of different way of doing it. And you guys obviously are not the only ones uh, proposing alternative schemes. Uh, you know, we've right. seen Cosmos, we've seen Polkadot, we've seen Solana, all these networks make kind of slightly different trade-offs between decentralization, bottlenecks, and sort of like speed throughput efficiency type things. Um, Solana gets criticized a lot for being a little bit more centralized than other things. But then on the other hand, they have, you know, you, you, you have to give them the credit of having created a community of people who can actually build products. 
um, that mainstream users can use on top of this network. As, so as long as the network doesn't go down. Yeah, yeah. As long as the network doesn't go down. Absolutely. Um, and so, you know, so there's all these solutions that are out there. And if you talk to the Solana people, they're like, you know, it's the practical way forward. If you right. talk to the zero knowledge roll up people, they will say, listen, we get all the trade offs, but we're making the best one. Not only is this thing um, super decentralized and private, it's also like really fast and practical to use. So you're getting all the benefits that you get from something like a Solana, but you're also getting the benefits of, you know, decentralization and, and self sovereignty and, and permissionlessness and so on. You know, if you talk to optimistic roll up people, they'll say, well, we're already in market with kind of a similar thing, but then the zero knowledge people will say, yeah, but you know your network isn't as secure as something like using zero knowledge proofs, even though we're a little bit slower sometimes and a little bit more expensive sometimes. And so you know, and then and then there's every like all the alternatives and, and kind of their economics and and uh, avalanche and, and something like this. So where do I stand? Well, first of all, I I always have been someone who believes in like a multi chain like outcome. I just think that there's going to be many different types of architectures and trade-offs that blockchains make that are going to be, you know, relevant for different kinds of applications. And so right. I, I, I see many blockchains sticking around. And I don't mean like five blockchains. I mean like hundreds or thousands or even more. And the reason that I think that is because I do think that like large businesses um, will, will want to run on their own app dedicated blockchains and they'll want to create custom optimizations for how their blockchain sort of works in the same way that their technology teams today create very bespoke and custom you know uh, architectures for whatever they're building like i used to work at amazon amazon's backend architecture that handles you know some insane amount of orders per second is not to be found in any other technology company it's just like completely unique right and completely optimized to whatever amazon is doing and that's what i that's why i think that there's going to be a lot of blockchains because there's going to be a lot of businesses that will want to bespoke optimize their app dedicated chains and and so like in that world i mean i, I see a lot of these technologies kind of like coexisting and, and, and interoperating and by the way there's been huge progress this year in blockchain interoperability. So right. Um, right. Like, like blockchain interoperability for a long time has looked like bridges that you send tokens. Right. But what we see now is a market of blockchains that are not just blockchains, they're also smart contract Turing complete computers. And what this has allowed right. is things like uh, layer zero, uh, yeah. hyperlane, right? Which are kind of yeah. more general messaging buses that allow kind of a broader interoperability, not just tokens, but NFTs, you know, reading state between blockchains, reading uh, or calling methods between blockchains. And what that amounts to uh, on a practical user level is omni-chain assets, like NFTs that don't live, quote unquote, on a particular chain, but live on all the chains and whatever chain you needed to live on, right? And, right. and, um, and, and I think that's, a, that's an exciting sort of future. Yeah, I, I think there's, uh, as you say, we're in a superposition, and like all of these things or none of these things could be true. There's uh, the 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 power of networks often come down to their ability to create network effects, and it's unclear at the moment whether or not the network effects can be garnered by interoperability, effect like fully effectively via interoperability, or whether or not like actually transitioning everything to a particular ledger that's right for that that set of industry applications is the right end end state. And I, I you know I could debate about this for forever. I think it's a fascinating area, but it's it's really interesting to see that you guys are keeping such an open mind on all of the potential outcomes. I have seen some investors sort of talk about you know if it's not EVM. Or if it's not EVM compatible, then it's not going to work um, because you know the 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 game's already like in the later stages because Solidity is a standard or the EVM is a standard, and I think that forgets how early all of this is and how much of an experiment it still is, which I think is a is, is sort of the right way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I certainly I've heard that view and I understand why people take that view, but I think that view 
um, really under indexes on things that are not visible in the market that are coming. Um, you know, like one project that I've been following and investing in for a long time is Urbit, right? And Urbit has a very, very different approach to um, consensus in general and actually like fills in a bunch of like private consensus mechanisms where, you know, we're mostly used to public consensus mechanisms um, in public blockchains. And I think Web3 people like kind of under underappreciate how much you really need that type of mechanism, uh, you know, in order to actually implement and 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 get Web3 adopted. Um, and and for example, like on that network today, there is a kind of layer two project called Akbar that is settling to Ethereum, but the uh, the programming language of those smart contracts is not. EVM compatible. It is Ur it's Urbit native, and what right. that means is that if Urbit, uh, which has a really big vision and sort of an accelerating set of adopters right now, like if they become really big, um, they'll just sort of naturally adopt this type of non EVM solution just because it's compatible with their network. So again, it you know I, I think there's a lot of latent factors that could throw a right. wrench into like the the EVM uh, theory. So it's been it's been such a pleasure talking with you. Um, and uh, if people want to find out more about you or, or CoinFund, where's the best place to, for them to go next? Uh, well, they can look up our website. It's CoinFund.io. They can look up my yeah. website, which is Brookman.com. And they can uh, follow me on Twitter at J-B-R-U-K-H, J-Brook. So Brookman.com, just for people, is B-R-U-K-H-M-A-N.com. That's correct. Uh, slightly yes. strange spelling. Jake, it's been such a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I look forward to uh, chatting with you again soon. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. You better call on these guys. I'm going radical. 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 I'm going radical